Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Paris Schutz. And I'm Brandis Friedman. On the show tonight... He wanted us to bleed out on the ground. Relatives of the people shot by Waukegan police say their loved ones' only crime was their skin color. Keep moving the goalposts. They, they, every time they say we move the goalposts, that means they're projecting. Democrats and Republicans fail to agree on a new stimulus deal, so what does that mean for the economy? With a new wave of COVID-19 cases, the city is using technology to help target testing. A new wave of election judges how a temporary law is allowing younger people to become poll workers amid the pandemic. Family is my beloved Alpha Kappa Alpha. Inspired by vice presidential nominee and Alpha Kappa Alpha member Kamala Harris, what some black sororities are doing to get out the vote. The history of a tucked away Hyde Park Street in Ask Jeffrey. You know, this, this period, this coronavirus pandemic, when we were kind of stuck here, um, it really gave us the opportunity to explore Chicago. And most summers they hike all over the world, but now they have some great local recommendations. But first, some of today's top stories. COVID-19 restrictions are returning to Chicago bars and restaurants starting this Friday. Governor Pritzker announced that today because the city, which is Region 11 under his reopening plan, has averaged more than twice as many COVID-related hospitalizations than a month ago, and the city's positivity rate has almost doubled since the beginning of October. The restrictions, he says, are necessary. When you see a consistent upward trend, like this in those two metrics. What you're seeing is that you're probably going to continue in that direction unless you do something more to bring down the positivity rate, bring down the hospitalizations. You've got to put some mitigations in place to try to, you know, flatten that upward direction and bring it back down again. The reinstated restrictions mean no indoor service for bars and restaurants. Outdoor service must end by 11 p.m. and any meetings or social events are capped at 25 people or 25% of overall room capacity. Similar restrictions will go into effect for suburban Cook County starting tomorrow. Meanwhile, statewide, the Illinois Department of Public Health reports 4,000 new cases and 46 additional deaths. The state has now recorded nearly 383,000 cases total and more than 9,500 deaths. The statewide positivity rate is now 6.4%. And late this evening on the PBS NewsHour, Mayor Lightfoot split with the governor on closing indoor dining and restaurants and says she hopes to work with Pritzker's office to find a way to keep them open. The Chicago Police Department is returning officers back to field duty too soon after they've fired their weapons. That's according to a new report from the city's inspector general. After an officer fires his or her gun in the field, CPD general orders require them to spend at least 30 days on desk duty and participate in traumatic incident stress management programs along with other trainings. But the OIG's report shows the department hadn't been complying with those policies and makes recommendations, most of which CPD has said it agrees with. For more on this story, please visit our website. And U.S. Senator Dick Durbin weighed in on the confirmation and swearing in of the Supreme Court's newest justice, Amy Coney Barrett. Durbin says based on her previous critiques of the Affordable Care Act, he expects that her vote could help the court overturn the act. The Affordable Care Act eliminated half of the uninsured people in Illinois. Half of them have insurance today because of it. To eliminate it means doubling the number of uninsured people in Illinois in the midst of a pandemic. It also means saying that pre-existing conditions can be used against you when it comes to the availability and cost of insurance. And now, Paris, we go back to you. All right, thanks, Brandis. A man is dead, the mother of his infant son hospitalized after Waukegan police shot them. Their families now are demanding justice. Amanda Vinicky joins us now with more. Amanda. Paris, before we go any further, a warning. Some of what you are going to hear is intense. It is emotional. There is no graphic video to accompany it, and we will explain why in just a bit. But certainly, a description of this situation at hand is disturbing. As 20-year-old Tafara Williams today gave her first full public account of the encounter she and her boyfriend, the father of her infant son, had with Waukegan police. Williams says she and Marcellus Jeanette were in a parked car. She'd gone there to smoke when a police car pulled over. 
he got out the police car. So I rolled down my windows and turned on all the lights inside the car. So the officer could see I had no weapons and I wasn't doing anything illegal. She says the officer appeared to know them, called them by name. She says he kept touching his hand to a gun and he then appeared to make a phone call. She says she was scared, so she drove away. That's when they encountered another police vehicle on a different street. It is unclear exactly what transpired. She says there was a crash. She lost control and the officer started shooting. I kept screaming, I don't have a gun. <laughs> but he kept shooting. He told me to get out of the car. I had my hands up and I couldn't move because I had been shot. Marcellus had his hands up. I kept asking him why, why he was shooting. She said more officers came. They yelled at them to get out of the car. Marcellus, the father of her seven-month-old infant, Marcellus Danette Jr., was shaking. There was a lot of blood. On the ground, everywhere, man. I get here, Marcellus still breathing. I told him, please don't shoot. I have a baby. We have a baby. We don't want to die. She says police covered Sinet with a blanket while he was still alive. I know he was still alive. And they took that away from me instead of letting. Oh, man. Sorry. He was still breathing. Oh, man. And they took me away instead of letting him. Man, they took me away. <laughs> and allowed him to die. They wanted us to bleed out on the ground. Williams is still in the hospital. That's where she gave that testimony to the media from. Her attorneys would not disclose the extent of her injuries beyond saying that they are extensive. Her version of the events of a week ago does not, however, match those provided by statements by Waukegan police. The police department says, well, the first officer was conducting an investigation. Williams was behind the wheel of the car that then fled. The second officer soon after spotted that car driving. And then when it stopped, he approached on foot. The car began to go in reverse. In fear for his safety, that second officer fired his gun. Now, that officer, the one again who shot the couple, is a Latino and a five year veteran of the Waukegan Police Department. His name has not been made public, but he has since been fired with the chief of the police department citing procedure violations. The Waukegan police do have and use body and squad car cameras. Thus far, neither Williams nor Stinnett's relatives or their attorneys nor media has seen footage from them. Footage that might help to clear up just what happened around midnight last Tuesday. Meanwhile, this situation is under review by the Illinois State Police and by the FBI. The Lake County State's Attorney says once the investigation is concluded, he will review it and then he'll make a decision about potential charges. Having all available resources and as many independent fresh eyes as possible is critical to this process. Michael Nierheim says, I continue to urge calm as we undertake this process and pledge complete transparency. It comes as Nierheim, a Republican, is fighting what is expected to be a close re-election battle against Democrat Eric Reinhardt, who in a statement says a deep look is needed at a judicial system that has led to the deaths of so many people of color. Well, Keegan's mayor, Sam Cunningham, was seen here while we talked with him earlier this year, says the city will publicly release all videos after the families have had the chance to watch them. Williams and Stinnett's families and their attorneys say that Waukegan is setting a good example by being so transparent. Nonetheless, they say they plan to file a lawsuit seeking both money and policy changes, including requiring de-escalation training 
for Waukegan police. Their relatives say they don't want other families to go through the heartbreak that they are going through. They are calling for justice. They're calling for an accountability and they're calling for an end to the racism they say is responsible for their tragedy. Just an hour or so ago, those families as well as supporters held a vigil for Marcella Stinnett. He was 19 years old. Paris, back to you. All right, man. A lot of questions there. And of course, we've got the situation in Philadelphia, too. Thank you very much. And now we go to Phil Ponce and a check in on the markets and the economy. Phil. Paris economists estimate 30% growth in the third quarter as coronavirus lockdowns eased. But even so, yesterday the Dow Jones fell 650 points. Today it fell another 200 points. So how do things look for the economy and what role could next week's election play in the market's expectations for the future? Joining us now to give us their thoughts are Edward Stewart, Professor Emeritus of Economics at Northeastern Illinois University, and Michael Miller, Associate Professor of Economics at DePaul University. Gentlemen, good to see you again. And uh, Michael Miller, let me stay with you. Uh, what would you say triggered what happened yesterday? I think there's uncertainty regarding the future of COVID. Uh, clearly, the economy is being driven in large part by the fear people have of going out. And when they don't go out, the businesses that uh, affected our hospitality and so forth. And people are seeing this then that while the GDP is going to explode compared to the second quarter going forward, the economy is just not uh, as growing as quickly as uh, we would hope that it would because of this fear. Ed Stewart, uh, what would you say is the cause or causes for what happened on Monday? The proximate cause, Phil, I think is what I might call stimulus pessimism. That I think earlier what was driving the market up was some belief that the White House, Steve Mnuchin, uh, Nancy Pelosi, Mitch McConnell would agree on some rational size stimulus package. And that was kind of keeping up optimism about the future of uh, economic demand and, and income. But once that seemed to go off the table uh, over the weekend, then I think the, the lack of any kind of stimulus and the fact that right now the Senate is uh, dispersed until after the election means that there won't be any kind of stimulus package until well into November or maybe December. And that's uh, dashed any hopes that investors had that the economy would get the, the needed boost that many experts say that it needs. Michael Miller, would you say that the, uh, that the lack of a stimulus plan and the fact that uh, one is not in the offing until after the election, that that was a, a profound and exacerbating factor? I think it definitely adds to the uh, to the information that the market is digesting. Uh, I just have one slight difference in terms of interpretation. While I am in support of the government doing something, I don't really see it as stimulus. I'm not sure it's going to make the economy grow necessarily faster. But what is very necessary is income redistribution because this this pandemic has led to a recession that has affected pretty much the people at the bottom and almost them exclusively, which is a very sad outcome. And because the government, in a sense, caused it by uh, imposing the policies that it did, I think it behooves the government to come up with a policy to assist those people. And that would keep the, uh, that would buoy, that keep the demand where we would want it to be. It's not necessarily going to make it greater such that the economy grows faster. But I think it's also necessary for the psychological future of the economy that people like that cannot be left on the sideline. Well, as you know, the president is painting a different picture. Here's ha what he had to say on Sunday on 60 Minutes. Let's listen. The economy is already roaring back, and uh, other people aren't going to bring it back. Certainly the person that we're dealing with is not going to bring it back. They're going to raise taxes. We created the greatest economy in the history of our country. We had the best stock market price ever, and we're getting close to that price again. The unemployment numbers for African Americans, for Asian Americans, for Hispanic Americans, Virtually every number was the best. Ed Stewart, how persuasive are the president's arguments that things are actually looking up? Well, the economy was was growing, of course. Uh, many people would say, of course, the president inherited a growing economy from uh, the Obama administration. And with regards to the stock market, yes, it's at the highest level, but 
that's not the important metric. The important metric is the percent increase. And in, in that particular case, the S&P 500 grew by a larger percentage under the first Obama administration compared to the first uh, and hopefully last uh, Trump administration. Numbers that came out last last week, um, unemployment rates for black Americans 20 and over, it's still over 12 percent. So yes, it might be okay, but it's certainly nowhere near what it needs to be for full racial equality and racial justice. And one more thing, Phil, it's different about this recession than any other recession I've, I've ever analyzed in my two or 300 years of, of doing this. In most recessions, the male unemployment rate is higher than the female unemployment rate. Because in classical recessions, what gets cut back is manufacturing and construction and so forth. And for the first time, we have a recession where the female rate is higher than the male unemployment rate because of cutbacks in hospitality and dining and conventions in um, education. So many economists have said this is this is a she session uh, as opposed to a, a recession. The unemployment rate for females is almost eight percent. The unemployment rate for males is seven percent. And so I think you have to focus also on the fact that this this particular recession is particularly hard on 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 women, and especially because in the United States, among any civilized country, we have the least inclusive and affordable childcare system in in um, high income countries. Michael Miller, does uh, does the market uh, favor one candidate over the other in in this election? From everything I've seen, I, I try to read about that. I'm a, an economist more than a market guy, but I don't see that that what I think what the market wants is for this to be settled. Uh, if you look at the thing called the VIX index, which is a measurement of the uncertainty and the volatility in the market, it's declining. If you look at the futures prices, they're all lower, which makes I think the market is kind of saying they expect an answer as to who will be president within a day or two after the election is over and that regardless of who it is at least it will be settled and that will give the market some certainty as to which direction the economy is going and uh, i think that would be nice I, I think it would it would uh, settle things down a lot um, so, so you're saying that uh, that that certainty as opposed to ambiguity uh is what uh what it would be good for the market. Uh, Mike, Absolutely. Let me, let me stay with you for a second because there's sure. a report on Market Watch that many investors now expect the stock market to crash. Do you? I, uh, of course, I would never say never. Not after having a pandemic. You know, on March 1st, we had, I think, the greatest economy we've almost ever had in terms of unemployment, inflation, and under control, and so forth. And then we have the pandemic. So I will never say never. I just don't see that there would be a sufficient uh, decline in corporate profitability and so forth going forward that would justify a crash. And where else can you put your money? You can earn no, you can earn money in stock, uh, bonds and uh, so forth in equal to zero percent. So people are going to be chasing yields, as they call it. They're going to be trying to find things that give them some kind of a, of a basic return. So where else can you put your money? And I think that people will continue to invest in stocks because firms are going to be continue to be reasonably profitable. And gentlemen, that is where we'll have to leave it. Ed Stewart, Michael Miller, thank you both for joining us. As always, we appreciate it. My pleasure. And up next, meet a first-time poll worker and what they're expecting on Election Day, so please stay with us. Latinos, who make up one-third of the population, continue to power a city that works. These are the people that are working three jobs, knowing that COVID is out there. Those are the people that need the help, and we should help them. A high turnout election in the middle of a pandemic, actually in the midst of the worst wave yet of that pandemic, presents a perfect storm of challenges. Older Americans typically serve as poll workers and election judges, but they're also the most vulnerable to complications from COVID. It sent state and local election authorities scrambling to find younger people, especially those from diverse cultural backgrounds, to fill that void. Joining us now with more are Aliza Huda, a first-time election judge, program leader with Asian Americans Advancing Justice and a junior at Lane Tech College Prep High School, and Shobana, Shobana Jori Vermi, the director of South Asian Outreach with the Chicago Board of Election Commissioners. 
First for you, Eliza, <laughs> you're, uh, you're too young to vote, but you aren't too young to work um, as an election uh, poll judge. Uh, tell, tell us why you wanted to get involved in this. Um, especially due to the pandemic, I know a lot of older people who normally would be working on election day at the poll place, they're not able to go out. And so I just kind of wanted to do my part and help out in any way I could. Um, and, yeah, so that's why I chose to. And, and tell me how that work is going so far. What have you seen so far with early voting? Um, I haven't been on keeping that much track on early voting, but I've been doing like my job in doing the training for the poll workers. Got it. Okay. And, and Shobana, have young uh, workers successfully filled that void uh, left behind by older Americans who might be a little nervous to, to be in polling places with COVID? They have, they have it and they have done it wonderfully. Uh, there's always been a great response from high school students, at least at the Chicago Board of Elections. Uh, we've partnered with Mikva Challenge in the past and uh, we've had uh, several high school students work with us uh, ser serving the polls. But this time around, especially 2020 being such a unique year um, because of the pandemic and with seniors safety, you know, keeping into the, that, keeping that in account, um, into account, we are definitely seeing uh, high schoolers or in general, um, young poll workers within the age bracket of like 16 to 24 stepping forward and supporting us. Uh, so yeah, the, the, there's, been a, this is, there's been a great response and we're really pleased by that. And Shobana, we heard Eliza say she's training poll workers. Tell me about some of the jobs that they're doing. So uh, unlike other elections where we do provide in-person training uh, before every election, um, thousands of poll workers from across the city of Chicago are uh, able to schedule their training over a period of one month and those trainings are provided in person. And uh, this year being uh, you know, in the middle of a global pandemic, we are providing online training, which is again, uh, you know, a great opportunity for everyone, especially new election judges to get involved because these trainings are very well put together in terms of, of course, they're missing out for, for the first time poll workers, they're missing out on hands-on experience, which they would have otherwise received in an in-person training, but the online training is just as, uh, you know, comprehensive and I, I'm, you know, Eliza could, you know, answer for that, that uh, we're trying to make sure that they're, uh, you know, keeping up with everything that's expected of them. They'll be checking in voters, they will be looking up signatures, they will be directing them towards the equipment, they will be tabulating results at the end of the day. Um, so it'll be a long day, but it'll be an action-packed day for sure. All right, Elisa, tell me how that training has been going for you so far. Um, I really enjoyed the training. I thought it was super informative. There was a lot of like little um, check-in points kind of where they tested your knowledge so far and then the quiz or the yeah the quiz at the end really wrapped it all up. All right, Shoban, it's not just about recruiting younger people, but uh, from diverse cultural backgrounds, uh, specifically uh, in the instance here, South Asian uh, workers. Why is it so important to get uh, uh, South folks that can speak Hindi, for instance, uh, uh, working in polls? It is very important because, you know, our country is just becoming more and more diverse by the day. And uh, South Asian community in Illinois and, for, and, and in Chicago, for that matter, is one of the largest uh, ethnic groups or at least the fastest growing ethnic groups here. So it definitely makes it all the more important for us to make sure that we're serving our democracy, right? We're making sure anyone who's eligible to uh, vote uh, in the elections is able to exercise their right to vote. And, and one thing we've realized over the years um, that um, there are several barriers. We may or may not realize that, but there are linguistic barriers, there are cultural barriers, people coming from all kinds of different experiences uh, in terms of you know the kind of democracy they're used to. Uh, so it's really important for them to be able to show up at a polling place, to be able to have resources in their language, to be able to interact with a poll worker who speaks their language and be able to exercise their vote. Otherwise, if you look at it from an immigrant's lens, uh, it can be a very intimidating experience, if, especially if you have limited proficiency in English. No, no so I really commend all the young, vote, young poll workers who are stepping up and helping our poll work or our voters who may not be able to speak fluent English. Alisa, you're, you're one of those young poll workers. Tell me about the concerns of going into the polling place on election day during this wave of COVID. Do you have any worries about that? Um, I was a little worried at first, but even recently we just got like a packet of like the new adjustments they're making due to the coronavirus and it has a lot of, um, they're going to be providing a lot of things to keep us safe. Shobana, what about that? What are the things to keep uh, workers safe? 
We're definitely sending several reminders and making sure that our polling places are well equipped with all kinds of PPE. Uh, we have plexiglass, we have all kinds of precautions. We're making sure that people have their masks on. Uh, we're keeping in mind social distancing guidelines. Uh, so we're making every possible precaution we can and making sure we advise poll workers and voters at the same time. And Shobana, very, very quickly, I'm sorry, very quickly, Folks can still sign up to be an election judge. Uh, tell us how to do that. They can go online. They can go to shypollworker.com and they can still apply online. However, the response has been overwhelming. So we do have several applicants still pending, uh, but we're still welcoming uh, applications if people are interested in doing so. Sometimes we get last minute resignations and spots open up. So even though the vacancies look kind of full right now, uh, there could be new opportunities popping up closer right. to the election. My thanks to Shobana, Joyri, Verma, and Aliza Huda. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Many of us have had to drastically change our travel plans in recent months. For the couple you were about to meet, that offered an opportunity to look more closely at what Chicago has to offer. Jay Shevsky first introduced us to Allison and Matt shortly after summer came to an end. Here's another look. Matt Sparapani and Allison Newberry weren't planning to be in Chicago this summer. Yeah, yeah. But like many of us, these Chicago school teachers had to rethink their plans. Well, we usually had big summer plans. Being teachers, you know, we have the summer off. And so um, this year we were going to go to Vancouver Island and do a, one of the classic hikes of the world, the West Coast Trail. And then do some more backpacking in, in the western United States in Idaho and in the Wind River Range in Wyoming. For the last 12 years, Matt and Allison have used their summers off to take on some of the greatest hikes in the world. And lucky for us, they're also both top-notch photographers. They've even written a book about it. This year, however, they've been forced by a pandemic to stay closer to home. Ooh, there's a kingfisher. Sweet. And it's changed their opinion about what Chicago has to offer nature-wise. We used to kind of bemoan the fact that we lived in Chicago. Like we, you know, really lived for the summer when we could get away and go to these exotic places that were so beautiful. But this year, they've had plenty of time to explore their own backyard. All of these photos were taken in the Chicago area. Like everybody, we got a little stir crazy and wanted to get outside and thought, well, let's go to one of our local forest preserves. But they didn't just go to one local forest preserve. This year, Allison and Matt have visited more than 60 natural areas in the Chicago region. And, they say, they know they have just scratched the surface. Today, they're at the Middle Fork Savannah Forest Preserve in Lake County. Most of their local photography is focused on wildlife, especially birds. So far this year, 173 species but they're not going to pass up the non-avian critters that present themselves. While the Chicago area can't claim any mountains or even many hills, Allison and Matt say they've come to love the wide variety of ecosystems, prairies, forests, wetlands, moraines. And it's not all about photography. Sometimes they do put their cameras back in the car. Usually when we're deciding where to go, we try to pick a place where we, you know, hoping that we'll see birds in the morning um, or in the late afternoon, and then we'll combine it with some other activity. We spent years uh, looking all over the world for beauty in nature, and uh, it turns out it's right out your own back door. And Matt and Allison have found that even if their destination is not grand and exotic, a walk, ride, or paddle in nature is not only a great way to be socially distant, it can also be a balm for a stressful time. 
For Chicago Tonight, this is Jay Shefsky. And on our website, you can find a map of all the places Matt and Allison visited this summer, along with a link to the detailed and photo-filled blog of their world travelers. And their book, Hiking Photography, All You Need to Know to Take Better Pictures on Every Trail, is available on our website. And now, Brandis, we go back to you. Pierre, thank you. Still to come on Chicago Tonight, how collecting race and ethnic data during the pandemic can help direct resources. With excitement around vice presidential nominee Kamala Harris's candidacy, a look at the work black sororities are doing to get out the vote. And the story of Hyde Park's first planned community, the Rosalie Villas built way back in the 1880s in this week's Ask Jeffrey. But first, some more of today's top stories. The city's top doc warns that both national and local coronavirus stats are heading in the wrong direction. Dr. Allison Arwady says nationwide cases are up 26% in one week in 45 out of 50 states. Meaning this is the worst we are doing on COVID as a country since the beginning. Also true in Illinois as a state as a whole, we are doing the worst that we've been doing in terms of case count as a state since the beginning of COVID. Arbody says Chicago is averaging nearly 800 cases a day, which is twice the level at which public health officials are concerned. Meanwhile, the city has added Florida to its quarantine list and put Michigan on the warning list likely to be added next week. A total of 31 states plus Puerto Rico are now on that list, requiring travelers from those places to quarantine for 14 days upon arrival to Chicago. This comes as the state reports 4,000 new confirmed cases and 46 additional deaths. The state has now recorded nearly 383,000 cases total and more than 9,500 deaths. The statewide positivity rate sits at 6.4%. Meanwhile, voters in Cook County are already shattering voting records. Despite the tremendous challenges that COVID-19 has imposed on all of us, and I mean all of us, it's clear to me that the voters are not going to allow this virus to suppress their right to vote. County Clerk Karen Yarbrough and her staff gave reporters a look at their nerve center for processing ballots and maintaining election equipment today. She says more than 555,000 vote by mail applications have been submitted, which is five times more than in 2016 and more than 250,000 have already been received and processed. Yarbrough also says that as of today, more than 230,000 voters have already cast their ballots compared to just 161,000 on the same day of early voting in 2016. When the pandemic hit, the city of Chicago found that there was a significant information gap when trying to collect race and ethnicity data. So DePaul University has developed a program that has narrowed the unknown race data gap in COVID-19 tests from 47% to just 11%. Here to tell us about how they did that and why collecting this kind of information is important are Daniela Stan Raiku, a professor of visual computing, artificial intelligence, and bioinformatics at DePaul University's School of Computing. She's also the director of DePaul's Center for Data Science and is the associate provost for research. And Margarita Reina, a senior epidemiologist at the Chicago Department of Public Health. Welcome both of you to Chicago tonight. Um, Daniela Raiku, let's start with you, please. So with DePaul's collaboration, um, along with the Chicago Department of Public Health, you were able to sort of remedy this uh, racial disparity that existed in the data. How did you, how were you able to fill in the gaps? This was a great opportunity for us to uh, step in and uh, look at the data um, and use uh, everything that was uh, available to us in terms of algorithms, in terms of census data, and use this prior information from uh, uh, census data in terms of surnames, geocoding, to make inferences about the uh, demographic uh, information that was missing from, uh, from, the, from the data. And Margarita Reina, why is it important that we know this information? Well, it's really a matter of racial equity. You know, the health department has built its entire health improvement plan on racial equity. And we see this imputation project as really, really aligned with our overall mission. And if we can't address racial inequities, 
and we can't address them until we fully understand them. So what, what does the city do with this information? Is it a matter of, you know, when you say addressing the issues, do you move resources and testing uh, based on what the, the data tells you? Yeah, exactly. So we, um, we learned that, you know, we know the geography, but we were very concerned early on when we saw these inequities in COVID cases and deaths. Um, and we were very concerned with the almost 50% of, of all the COVID tests that were missing race ethnicity. But as we found, um, worked with DePaul, and we were able to, to predict um, a lot of these, about 75% of these missing race, race ethnicities, we're able to better um, use these resources to uh, do messaging, to um, provide testing, and, um, and everything for, to have the resources in those communities that really need them. And Daniela Reich, who uh, you were able to reduce the missing data, as we mentioned, from 47% to 11%, uh, but you were inferring the racial information based on the demographic information and the names of the patient. Um, how are you certain that you can be getting accurate or close to accurate results? Uh, so uh, we have been uh, uh, using testing data um, that uh, had the uh, um, demographic information. So. Uh, we were able to test our algorithms against data that had the demographic information. And once we reach the uh, confidence level and the accuracy of the algorithm, then this is where we move into using these algorithms in predicting the data without the uh, race information. And you said once you reached a confidence level, what, what made you confident? What, what, what did you need to see to be confident? <laughs> So 80% was the confidence level that we used for our algorithms, but these algorithms work, you can increase the confidence uh, uh, level um, as well as you can add more information into the, these algorithms to increase the confidence such as first name and any other information that becomes available for each one of these cases. So late this afternoon, we spoke with the Director of Social Emergency Medicine at the University of Illinois Hospital and Health Sciences System, where they are reopening their testing tent with this latest surge in COVID cases. Here's what she had to say. Every testing center is a little bit different, but even here at, at University of Illinois, when you register a patient, you typically ask them, how do you identify? It's also a question of how the question was posed, because um, I think for Latinos, especially picking a race is, not something that we think about because most of us are mixed. So we identify with our ethnicity, but not specifically a race. So sometimes, you know, it's just hard to answer that question if you don't know exactly what the reason for the question is. Margarita Reyna, is that part of the reluctance to for people to give that information? Well, that is certainly, I mean, you know, if the question is not even on the form or, you know, if you reserve your, your, um, your test, uh, reservation online, usually they will ask, but not all of the test testing facilities actually have the same questionnaire. So there is an ordinance from the commissioner of the health department and the mayor. We have, you know, we've tried to enforce that. And I mean, that is, that, that is a problem, but when people learn about it, they're more a, we're, um, able to answer the question, right? So um, hopefully people are going to be asked the question and then they can answer it. But in those cases where we don't have the information, this has been a really uh, wonderful um, collaboration with DePaul to have a solution, an innovative uh, solution to this, to this issue. And Daniela Raiku, are there plans uh, for sharing this, this algorithm uh, you know, with other communities that might need it? Uh, absolutely, we are prepared to do so. Uh, so uh, um, working with uh, Margarita and her team, uh, opens up the doors for other um, opportunities and to help other communities. Um, and the algorithm that we use, the tool, uh, is being used by the city right now, and we are ready to uh, to apply it on other data. And Margarita Reyna, we've got just uh, about 20 seconds left, but you know, could this program have applications for other illnesses like HIV or syphilis or any other STDs? Definitely. I mean, um, fortunately, HIV and STDs um, hopefully don't have as high as a, as a, um, the percent of, of folks who we have missing information for, but definitely in other public health indicators and even other departments. Um, I think that this tool is innovative and it will help um, 
really understand where we're at, it, not just in COVID, but other public health and other health okay. indicators. And we'll have to leave it there. My thanks to Margarita Reyna and Daniela, Daniela Raiku. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure. Thank you. Up next, how members of black sororities are turning out to vote in a conversation that originally aired on Sunday's Chicago Tonight Black Voices. But first, a look at the weather. When early voting began in Atlanta earlier this month, there was an image of black women, this one right here, marching in unison, swept across social media. For the first time in history, these women, members of four historically black sororities, saw one of their own on the ballot for vice president, Senator Kamala Harris, who is a member of the Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority. Harris's nomination was not only a historic occasion for black sororities, it was a fitting one as their work has been instrumental in securing the vote for black women. And more than a century later, they're still working to get out the vote. Joining us now with more is Kimberly Agoen, an Alpha Kappa Alpha member and social, Nash, excuse me, social action chairman of the National Panhellenic Council Chicago chapter. Kimberly, welcome back uh, to Chicago Tonight Black Voices. Thanks for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here, Brandis. Thank you. So, of course, you know, black sororities have had a long history of fighting for the vote. Who were some of those women and what did they do? You know, from Rosa Parks, who was a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha to Ida B. Wells, who was a member of Delta Sigma Theta, the history is storied and it's at every level, even at, on um, levels that are not necessarily national. For example, Jacqueline Vaughn, who was the president of the Chicago Teachers Union, one of um, Stacey Davis Gates predecessors. So it's been a, a movement that has gone on even before the 100 years ago when women were given the right to vote. Black women have always fought on behalf of every aspect of moving our community forward. And in these organizations in particular, they are rooted in community service, in scholarship, and in working toward the progress of our communities. And of course, there's huge excitement uh, around the candidacy of Senator Harris. Here's a clip uh, from her nomination acceptance speech where she talks about her chosen family. Family is my beloved Alpha Kappa Alpha, our divine nine, and my HBCU brothers and sisters. Obviously uh, pretty exciting for a lot of AKAs to hear her uh, give that shout out right there, I'm sure. Um, what does it mean to black Greek organizations to have one of their members as a vice presidential candidate? I think that it really kind of highlights this idea that we've already known that black people in particular are extremely talented and have been a part of this process. And it's wonderful at this point to see someone who's from an HBCU and also who is among the ranks of our Divine Nine organizations to finally get that opportunity to finally break through that glass ceiling. We've already known that we've had the talent, but to finally see someone there, that, that to get an opportunity to be there is, is really a, a very strong, prideful moment. And Kimberly, what differentiates uh, historically black sororities and, and fraternities really um, from predominantly white ones? Well, I think one of the things is the way that we came together. We're talking about the turn of the last century in which, you know, times similar to these, even worse for, for black people in this country, a lot of violence and a lot of having to come together to rely upon each other in, in the face of danger and violence. And just to build upon being the first people in your family to go to college, the first people in your family to be professionals and to really rely on that. Um, and to just make the decision that you're gonna be community service minded. And also it is a lifetime commitment. It's not one of those things that when you're after college, you just say, I'm just an alumni and you go sit down, but this is a lifetime commitment. We have got thousands of chapters all over this world and many right here in the United States, most in the United States that are doing programming to, to progress every area of our communities. Yeah, that's right, there are college chapters and then of course what we call grad chapters yes. for those who have graduated college. Um, there's also a social service uh, component that is a strong, important part of black sororities. Definitely. I mean, when we're talking about the sororities from uh, Sigma Gamma Rose Project Reassurance to Zeta Phi Beta's uh, Z Hope to Delta Sigma Theta's five point uh, pro programmatic thrust to Alpha Kappa Alpha's five international program targets and signature program. 
we are organizations that do work and we are everywhere. We are working with children, we are mentoring, we are working with the homeless, we are working with women right now because we're in October, we have chapters who are ensuring that every woman, no matter what race or economic background has access to mammograms, free mammograms. So we are working and we cannot leave out our brothers because we have five black Greek organizations for our fraternities who are working just as hard as we are. And it is such a privilege to serve in these organizations. So what kind of get out the vote efforts uh, are the sororities engaging in right now, today? Yeah, so really it's four um, aspects. We wanna start, we've started with voter registration. We have been registering voters all over the Chicagoland area in particular, you know, National Panhellenic Council of Chicago, of whom Malcolm Whiteside, member of Phi Beta Sigma, is the president. Um, we have, we're the largest chapter in the United States. So we have been registering voters since July or August. And starts with that, then you want to educate. Much like WTTW does, we don't take a stand on any candidates. What we do is try to get the information and the education of people so that they can look at the issues that are impacting our community and decide accordingly. Then mobilization, we want to make sure people have got a safe way to get to the polls and that every person has a 2020 voting pandemic plan so they know exactly how they're going to vote and they make sure at least 10 people in their circle also follows their plan all the way through and have PPE and everything they need to vote safely or to vote by mail. And then finally, participation. None of it matters if you don't actually come out and vote. And that is the number one key to this. We want everyone to be able to vote and have their voices heard. So we're even into election protection, where we have attorneys who are making sure that happens. And Kimberly, you know, going back a little bit, you know, what, what moved you to pledge AKA at the time? Well, you know, it, it was, you know, family members also, it was just the right choice for me. Um, I, I, my, the people who I knew, the women who I have modeled myself after were all AKA. So that, that was very important to me, the women who have been instrumental. But I will say this, there have been women who have been instrumental in my life who belong to all of these organizations. And Brandis also, there is the sisterhood called Black Womanhood, women who weren't in any of these organizations, as a matter of fact, they've all been instrumental in my life and we just want to make sure that every person who wants to join one of these organizations right now we've got the spotlight on us that they just seek that out and figure out what is best for them because it really is an honor to be a part of a sisterhood true story the sisterhood exists no matter what how real quick before i let you go how has being an aka uh, helped your career oh well you know from the moment that you become one of these organizations, first of all, they see something in you as far as leadership. But the moment you get in the organization, you are on a leadership track. You are learning how to run meetings. You are learning how to form actual programs from the beginning to end, how to plan events, how to take votes. And most importantly, you are learning what our community needs, where our priorities need to be, and how to educate and engage with all of our community for the upliftment of our community. So that has helped immeasurably. Again, that conversation first aired on Chicago Tonight Black Voices, which you can catch right here on WTTW Sunday evenings at 6. And now we go back to Paris and the history behind a row of villas in Hyde Park in an all-new Ask Jeffrey. Paris. A tucked away Hyde Park Street sits as a time capsule from the days before the neighborhood was even part of Chicago. Jeffrey Bayer joins us with a story of the Rosalie Villas in this week's Ask Jeffrey. Hey Jeffrey, how you doing? I'm doing great. Hi, Paris. All right, it's good to see you. So this comes from Julia Snyder, not surprisingly, from Hyde Park. She says, I grew up in Hyde Park on a stretch of Harper Avenue where most of what appear to be the original frame houses are still there. We were told that when the homes were built, the nearby train tracks were at ground level. We were even told that the original homeowners were allowed to have boats and could drag them across the tracks onto the beach. So is any of this true? All right, well, let's take a look at this charming stretch of homes uh, along um, Harper Avenue in the Hyde Park neighborhood between 57th and 59th Streets. Um, they were part of Hyde Park's first planned community. It was known as Rosalie Villas, built way back in the 1880s. Remarkably, almost all of these Queen Anne and shingle style homes are still standing almost 140 years later albeit with some remodeling and restoration. So the Rosalie Villas were developed by one Rosalie Buckingham. Uh, she was a wealthy heiress 
whose name Chicagoans will likely recognize from Buckingham Fountain in Grant Park, which is named for Rosalie's cousin, Clarence. The Buckinghams were one of early Chicago's wealthiest families, having made their money in the grain elevator business. But Rosalie Buckingham is even more famous to PBS and WTTW viewers for an entirely different reason, and I will reveal that reason in just a minute. Um, so uh, the houses on Harper Avenue were designed to attract middle and upper middle class professionals uh, from uh, in that period of the 1880s. Um, some of them are thought to have even been marketed as lakefront vacation homes, uh, because this was way back when Hyde Park uh, was part of the larger Hyde Park Township, which was a huge swath of the south side that was not actually part of Chicago uh, at that point. Uh, it was annexed to the city in 1889. The design of the development was overseen by the architect uh, uh, who was already famous for having designed Pullman, which is the planned community we're looking at right here, uh, on what is now Chicago's far south side. His name was Solon Spencer Beeman. Uh, Beeman provided the overall vision for Rosalie Villas, uh, which is what we're looking at now, um, and he designed many of the houses and there were rules that homeowners and other architects had to follow, which led to the continuity of the size and style of the homes that you can still see today. And, and also, as in Pullman, um, the architect Beeman designed Rosalie Villas to be a sort of self-contained community, including this three-story clubhouse at Harper and 57th Street. Uh, it's gone today. And now the famous Powell's Bookstore uh, stands on that same corner, Harper and 57th. And uh, just across the street from the clubhouse uh, were the Rosalie Music Hall and the Red Roses Cafe. Both are now gone. And if that isn't enough rose for you, even the street itself was originally named Rosalie Court. Sounds like a jump in place back in the day, Jeffrey. So why was the development built in the first place? Well, the short answer is that it was just a commercial venture for Rosalie Buckingham. Uh, development began in 1883. Lots were sold starting in 1885. Uh, but her involvement in the project was actually short-lived because in 1890, she married none other than Harry Selfridge, who was then the retail manager at Marshall Field's department store. But of course, he went on to start the enormously successful Selfridge's department store in London. And here's that WTTW PBS connection. Mr. Selfridge, of course, was the focus of a PBS drama of the same name from a few years ago. And so WTTW viewers might know Rosalie from that show by her married name, Rose Selfridge. And of course, Jeremy Piven there, the actor, a Chicago area native. All right, so, so back to the original question. What about the boats being dragged across the train tracks? Uh, did that happen? Yeah, well, so today the Illinois Central Railroad tracks do run on an elevated embankment right behind the houses uh, that, that's used for uh, by the Metro Electric commuter trains. But our questioner is right that at first the trains ran at grade level. In this photo, the tracks, you can just see them. They're just visible on the left side of the frame. This meant the original homeowners essentially did have lakefront views. And so it's entirely possible that residents uh, dragged their boats over the tracks to enjoy the, the lake or maybe the lagoons in Jackson Park. Uh, but if they did, it was only for a few years. Uh, in 1892, the tracks were elevated on embankments ahead of the World's Columbian Exposition, which of course took, right, took, took place right there in, in Jackson Park uh, the following year, 1893. Um, today, many of the houses retain the names of their original owners. Here's the Cook residence with its brown shingles and arched porch near 57th Street. Um, and here's the conjoined J.J. Jackman house near 59th Street, um, a duplex or double house. Now it was designed by the development architect Solon S. Beeman himself, but he violates his own mandate there because uh, his original mandate was requiring only detached homes in the community, and this is a duplex. Those are some beautiful homes, though. All right, Jeffrey, another kernel of knowledge here that I knew nothing about. Thank you so much. My pleasure. And don't forget, you can visit our website for more details about Hyde Park's Rosalie Villas. And while you're there, don't forget to submit your own question to Jeffrey Bayer. That's all at WTTW.com slash Ask Jeffrey. And now, Brandis, we go back to you. Always learning something on Jeffrey. Thank you, Paris.
With the millions of ballots cast across the country, Chicago Tonight Black Voices hosted a community conversation last night about the election and its impact on the black community. Here's a short clip from the conversation about campaign outreach to black voters. You know, I think this notion of the black voting voting block is really convenient, um, but obviously there are so many differences along generational lines, along gender lines, along um, LGBT community lines. Sometimes it feels like pandering. It feels like, especially given this summer and given the uh, protests and the looting and the unrest and the calls for justice and change that we saw, um, I think people, politicians seized on that and said, hey, look, we're, we're going to make a change. And that's Rachel Hinton of the Sun Times, who says that we'll have to wait to see if candidates follow through with their promises to the black community. You can watch the full version of this conversation on our YouTube channel at WTTW Chicago. And mark your calendars for our next community conversation on Monday, November 30th at 8 p.m. And that's our show for this Tuesday night. Please join us tomorrow night live at 7. New COVID restrictions for Chicago bars and restaurants, including suspending indoor service. Plus... Plus, painting Alebrije, or Mexican folk art sculptures, in a virtual art class. Now, for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you so much for watching. Stay healthy and safe, and we'll see you right back here tomorrow. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm that is proud of their attorneys selected for the 2020 Illinois Super Lawyers List.